So, and um, the, uh, the requirements for successful completion I'd like to share. And uh, today, the purpose of this education activity is to enhance the knowledge base of registered nurses in the area of the RN's role and associated competencies in education and health information technology in an effort to optimally manage the use of um, HIT and patient care delivery as evidenced by the development, hopefully, at the uh, facility level once you take this information and go back to your, to your various organizations, um, level solutions needed to achieve value-based um, care delivery. In order to do that, the objectives for today's webinar is to identify trends for nursing informatic roles and how they align with health care reform. Uh, we're going to describe the opportunities for nurse informaticists in, uh, to impact solutions in various practice settings and talk about three areas of health, uh, health IT care delivery commonly impacted by nursing informatics and discuss how an interprofessional approach can optimize solutions to the, uh, to the HIT, to HIT, uh, common HIT uh, challenges. Um, in order to receive contact hours, um, you need to be what, in one of three places. You either need to be registered through the Texas Nurses Association GoToWebinar system. We have approximately 300 people registered for today. If you're not able to register or you're sitting around, you're a group sitting around a, a phone uh, and you're at a group site, then please note that you need to have a sign-in sheet and those sign-in sheets need to be emailed to me within 24 hours of the completion of the webinar. Um, or if you're on phone only, then you also need to send me an email confirming your attendance uh, to the email address that I'll share later. Please note that you need to be present uh, on the webinar until its completion um, and its actual ending time, which includes the question and answer period. Um, and then we'll be asking you to complete and submit the activity evaluation form. We'll share a link to that evaluation form at the completion of the webinar, and you'll have two weeks in order to complete the webinar after uh, uh, to complete the evaluation. After the, uh, after the two weeks, the evaluation uh, uh, survey monkey will be closed and there will be no further access and you will not be able to receive contact hours. Um, so if you're here and you've signed in, you're here for the entire activity and do the evaluation, approximately two weeks after this webinar, we will be sending you a certificate of successful completion for 1.0 contact hours. Please note that the planning committee members and presenters of this CNE activity um, have disclosed no relevant personal or professional or financial relationships related to, related to the planning or implementation of this CE activity. All right, now we got the housekeeping stuff done. Let's go ahead and get started with why y'all are here. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce our two presenters uh, for today's uh, webinar: Dr. Mary Teets and uh, Ms. Donna Montgomery. Uh, when it comes to healthcare information technology, Dr. Teets' credentials run long and deep. She is board certified by the American Nurses Credentialing Center in Informatics uh, uh, Informatics Nursing. She is a fellow of the Healthcare Information Management System Society and associate professor at Texas Women's University College of Nursing Dallas Center. Dr. Teets has experience uh, to match her credentials. She has taught nursing and informatics. She's implemented clinical computer systems and in her role as director of nursing um, research and informatics for the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council Education and Research Foundation. She deployed a three-year technology implementation project on behalf of an awarded National Institute of Health grant funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Donna Montgomery is currently uh, System Director of Nursing and Patient Care Informatics for the Baylor Healthcare System. Um, in that role, she is responsible for providing leadership, consultation, and coordination of clinical informatics uh, processes and integration of system-wide clinical information technology strategies. She also provides oversight across the Baylor system of the clinical informatics teams that implement the electronic information uh, systems that support uh, delivery of care. Um, Donna is board certified in nursing informatics and has, had, and has held many nursing leadership roles on oncology administration, patient safety, quality, and informatics. <clears throat> so with that, the introduction, um, and without further ado, I will now turn the webinar over to Mary and Donna. Okay. Uh, so we've got a switch over, and you yep. see our first slide there. Does that look okay? okay. Yes, it looks fine, Mary. Thank you. So as Laura had said, this is a 
con the conversation about nursing solutions and to common IT challenges. And just a reminder that this is the first of three of our spring webinars. The other two have to do, uh, will follow with data management for actually getting to information. And that will be the next one coming up. And then the communication for optimizing uh, health information technology. So communication at the CIO level and other uh, between nursing and other organ, um, departments. And that will be the third one. Those are both available for registration on the texasnurses.org website. So uh, definitely more to come for today, from today. And just a background on this organization, it's a, com a combination of the TNA Tone Health IT Committee. This was a um, resolution in 2010 to uh, House of Delegates that the charge would be to determine implications of healthcare informatics on nursing practice and education, and then to in include nationally based TIGER uh, initiative, which is Technology Informatics Guiding Educational Reform. And so that's the structure with which we are presenting to you today. We have a framework on this is a slide three, and hopefully you've got a, these slides through your email. If not, then just you know let us know uh, through the email back to us, and we will be sure that you get them. But basically, it has to do with our framework of the environmental forces on the upper right-hand corner that affect us, healthcare reform, advanced practice nurses taking more of the lead in terms of uh, managing the health of the population, the HRs being implemented, and so forth, the, the informatics nurse credentialing that's, and standards that are in place. But we believe that there's 300,000 nurses, RNs, LPNs, uh, technicians, that are being using uh, information technology. And so there, because of that, we wanted to get up on it and get some awareness out to the to the Texas nurses and have them prepared. We believe that this has a patient safety and quality impact. And then we'll also be benchmarking our progress through the years as we implement these technologies. The members, as you see, are here as a listing of both practice nurses and education and administration, along with the Texas Nurse Association support staff. And then on slide five here, it just basically says our main three initiatives being uh, CNE, as I had mentioned, a state survey of the nurses' experiences using electronic health records. And then right now on the far right, we have about a dozen schools of nursing that are actually using our packaged information. It's our basics of informatics that we teach. We will actually uh, work with the faculty and schools of nursing to get that to uh, both the associate degree and bachelor bachelor degrees um, nursing curriculum. And they map uh, to the essentials as well that are necessary. So that's the information. This year we're excited because we have a new committee on communication networking. And that will be uh, making our communications to everybody even more strong in this regard. We do have our, um, our initiatives, as you can see on slide six, matched to the IOM Robert Wood Johnson report where they talk about technology. And then also on slide seven, we have our ways that we interact with the TIGER initiative. Okay, so that's the background on what we do. And then finally, there's the, all the ways to keep connected. So today, this is a beginning and not an end. This is where we hope you become partners with us through this process in Texas and actually throughout the country, where we need to band together to, to pick up the speed, so to, so to speak, and uh, make this all work for us in a more in an ideal fashion. Okay, so Laura has already described the, the objectives for today, and we'll just start right into them. Objective number one being the role of the nurse in, in, in informatics and how that is affected by healthcare reform. And it's just basically, you know, the informatics nursing, the history of it in terms of the actual book, in terms of the standards, and the work by Peniers and Gazzard in 1996, which did differ differentiate the practice as it shows there for the differentiation of nursing informatics as its own entity. One of the things that I like about uh, informatics and clinical information systems is this slide where it actually shows you the whole iterative process where uh, starting at, with, at the uh, professional nursing practice, add technology at the bottom, 
now you've got an information system. But you also have to not forget about human factors. Don is going to talk about that more. You have to have to adoption of the technology. You have to have use of it. And then you gain clinical knowledge. And as you gain clinical knowledge, you gain data. And it's an iterative process that goes on to eventually improve patient care delivery. Another way to look at this is through the um, nursing education health informatics model. And that is uh, something that's been used by Dr. McBride and myself and published with Dr. Fenton recently in a journal. And basically, the federal and state regulations that impact uh, the point of care delivery, the data analytics and management that go along with the data, that the whole reason you're doing this is to get more data and be smarter about patient care, and then the patient, the population and patient safety and quality impact. And that should all then improve care. So today, um, we do have the ANCC certification, but there are other things I'd like to mention that we're on the pre um, precipice of, and that has to do with other programs such as post master certificates. And there, there are these all throughout the state of, uh, throughout the country, but I think Texas, because of the way we're getting together and we're working together as education, as practice, as vendors, we're going to be able to soon be delivering on some post master certification, even on a master's degree, maybe in nursing slash clinical informatics. And then there's also the health pro, health information technology professionals that were part of the federal um, government. Office of National Coordinator, a way for them to articulate uh, beyond being an EHR specialist and uh, progress from there. So there's some good things happening in education there. And as it says by the uh, HEMS organization, the, uh, the statement being that well-designed systems are one that su are supported the process and specific by specific care providers, that they accept the integration of the information into the system and then the resources are provided to support that. And Donna's an, uh, work is an excellent example of that that you'll hear about today. In terms of the federal initiatives, you see that the catalyst for that was set in terms of either getting incentives or disincentives uh, for not having an electronic health record in place. And so that's a lot of the movement that we're seeing right now. It's your federal uh, tax dollars at work in a very good way uh, to implement uh, care for patient care. So, and then along with that is the whole meaningful use of it. So there are significant standards associated with that. So being knowledgeable about the whole federal initiative. And we do have our webinars from last year that you can actually go back to on the website. It says previous webinars. And we have gone through these ad nauseum. <laughs> I don't want to really use that word. But each one is in detail depending on what you want to see. And we're, so here to this year, we're actually stepping it up to a little bit more uh, solutions orientation. And so and one of the things that we discovered last year and said that we wanted to have this triad of risk management, specialist quality improvement, patient safety and uh, quality, and then clinical informaticists all working together. That's when you get the most bang for your buck, so to speak, in terms of your systems. And Donna is going to actually give you the, the operational aspect of that. But the point here is that our federal government, and this is your tax dollars at work, and Donna's going to give you some references. One of them is a lot of training information, a lot of good uh, lessons learned on, that is being developed by the High Tech Act as part of the initiative. Again, your tax dollars at work. So they have to make this all publicly available. And that's where it is. So we're guiding you to those places and uh, helping you to understand which are the ones to use and so forth. The other thing is there's actually books and pro uh, pro projects that are used that identify why we're doing this. And the Institute of Medicine has a book uh, that actually talks about patient safety and health IT. So we, this shouldn't be in a mystery to any of us, because it's well documented, evidence-based, as to what needs to happen. And then we had the work, too, about, uh, from Dr. Tiddick on, on untoward consequences, if you don't. Okay? And there's also then the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which talks about the hazard management. This is how you report incidences so that the vendors, the providers, the actual just the practicing person who, who encounters a near miss, if you will, now has a way. And then and we actually learn. It's very similar to when the, uh, you know, we started tracking uh, through you know, assembly events and joint commission uh, standards like that. Now we have that for health information technology. And there's a definition here on slide 20 about on, it's an, an untoward event uh, of IT is 
it's that a neither anticipated uh, uh, nor spe the specific goal of a CPOE, for example. Okay, and the other way to look at it is it's both there are both undesirable and desirable. So sometimes, oh my, you know, we learn something good about the computer. So it goes both ways. And there have been studies on uh, that indicate that the untoward uh, unintended consequences tend to be grouped in nine particular groupings. And the only reason I'm bringing this up here, as you see them on your slide, is that it's the interprofessional approach that has a favorable impact on this. And evidence shows over and over and over, the more you get everybody at the table at the same time working on these issues, the, the more you're going to progress in terms of patient safety and quality. But now you know what the events actually are. So in a, in a nutshell, basically, I know you all have seen this slide before, and our, 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 our colleague, Jim Turley, has allowed us to, to utilize it over and over, too. You can piece things together in health IT and have an interface where it kind of runs, but it might not look good and it might have some uh, weaknesses in, in the seams, <laughs> as opposed to an integrated car. I think we'd rather be the red car. And with that in mind, we want to notice that as our the innovative activity for nursing informatics in 2013. The other thing, on, now we're on objective number two, is that the Tiger community says that the requirements should be that the clinician, not the information technology department, is, or the vendor is the one identifying the practice for information technology in a clinical information system. And that workflow analysis is critical and that based on each department's work. And so that's a key for the basis of it. Here's just an idea, uh, an indication of where nurses and informatics tend to be working. And as you can see, they're in system implementation, development, and then liaison to the various committees. And then Donna's going to take over with more practical information for you all. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, I, I really like this slide because I think that it is um, a great example, and Dr. Eddy said it best when he said the complexity of modern medicine really exceeds the inherent limitations of the unaided human mind. And really, if we look at this picture, it's one example of many in our, particularly in our acute care setting, where technology is all around the patient, uh, supporting the patient, supporting the clinician, providing um, advances to help the outcomes of our patients. But with technology, we also, as we heard from Mary, can potentially bring harm into the setting. And so being able to um, have our clinicians prepared to be able to have a voice in how, I, how the IS product and life cycle phases uh, are implemented uh, in our organizations is important. So one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit to you all about today is part of the Baylor approach of how we've tried to address this. Because we know that nurses, are, nurses and other clinicians are critical to help understand how, how um, technology should be built, how it should be designed, and how it should be implemented. But we also know that that takes a special skill set. Um, and nurses, although they may have some basic understanding of informatics and technology, we know that there is a, a larger skill set that needs to be developed. So um, one of the things we've done at Baylor is that we have begun to identify people within our facilities and across the health system that are the key individuals that come to the table to help uh, represent the voice of the clinicians. And so we have formed small informatics teams that are facility-based across our health system. We currently have 14 hospitals. And so within each of those hospitals, we have small teams of informatics, nurses, uh, and other informatic cl uh, clinicians. Uh, one of the roles that we have specifically for nursing, we call an IRN here. And the IRN is really an informatics resource nurse. These are bedside nurses who 80 to, about 85 percent of their time is devoted to um, the informatics um, activities that are needed at the facilities. Uh, the other 
percentage of their time they are using the clinical systems and caring for patients. So uh, this has been a uh, very important role. You'll see some examples of things that they participate in on a daily basis. You can see that we also have those roles for other, for other clinicians besides nurses, but I know today we're mostly focused on the roles of nursing, so I will uh, give examples as we walk through this. Uh, part of our uh, development of our roles and the skill set, we, we have a multi uh, uh, we have a multiple a pro, multiple um, way to approach that. Uh, one is through education, others are through application, and then networking. Uh, we've heard today about some of the formal education that nurses can uh, can uh, participate in to make to help them with their skill set so that they can enter into nursing informatics practice. Um, what we have found here is that we can't get enough formally trained nurse informaticians, so we are uh, teaching that here at Baylor. We are also using other educational venues and networking to develop that. So our informatics nursing roles are really emerging in all areas. We're very focused right now at Baylor in the area of acute care, of patient safety and quality, We'll be uh, working on ambulatory more next year as part of our strategy. Uh, rehab, uh, we have some experience there, but we are developing that even more for the future. And then I know that we have some um, fellow nurses on the phone that are probably coming from some of our more rural areas. And we do, and I do believe that this model that I'm talking about even though you might not be a real big health system, you can use some of these concepts and some of these resources to also develop your own nurses and own clinicians in your facilities. Next slide. Um, so what I want to do is now talk about uh, three areas of health IT care delivery that nursing informaticians nor can commonly impact and give you some examples of what we've done at Baylor. So three areas that I've chosen to talk about today and give you all some examples. One is around clinical documentation. So the IRNs, or the informatics resource nurses, and other informatics team members participate in a regular basis in all the phases of, um, of IT uh, products that are brought into our facilities. So that includes the design phase. It includes the build phase. It includes testing supporting when it's time to implement, and then helping with the evaluation of did we get it right and did we solve the problem that we expected to solve. So one of the activities that we've coined here is called shadow chart, and we say here we shadow chart everything. It's really a type of clinical testing that needs to happen uh, with the technology that has been designed and built. But we're actually doing an analysis also of the workflow impact, looking for any policy implications that maybe we did not identify during the design and build phase, um, and really t working with our education colleagues about uh, what kind of educational approach. Is this an e-learning type of education? Is it a classroom type of education? Or is it just an elbow-to-elbow -elbow type of implementation? Barcode Med Admin is another good example of where our nurse informaticians have been critical in our implementation. We, um, we, have, in, we have rolled out our CPOE implementation at one of our uh, big hospitals here within the Baylor Healthcare System, and the nurses were critical in helping us get that closed loop uh, really right for nursing and really to be a way to support nursing practice and provide a safety net. Uh, prior to the administration. So some examples of things that the nurses have helped with is uh, reminders that need to be built in the system. One of them is a reminder to check the INR level of the patient prior to a Coumadin dose. Another one is that if we scan one pill, but actually the order's for two pills, it will remind the nurse, you've only scanned one pill, you really need two. Another example is that our IRNs and our human factors team have did some usability testing prior to implementation to help us with the type of scanners that the nurses would be using and were we really having a good safety net in place and what kind of alerts were appropriate. 
Um, we've given you an appendix of more information, uh, particularly around alert fatigue, which is a common topic within nursing informatics and clinical decision support. One alert that we have chosen to implement at Baylor, and we are in the process of evaluating and optimizing uh, that, could, that is considered a clinical decision support tool, is our sepsis alert, which is really built in our system to pick up a percentage change in vital signs and a lactate level that the patient has can alert the clinician, do you need to consider using a sepsis screening tool at this point to see if the patient really is potentially a sepsis patient. So those are some examples of things that our informatics resource nurses and directors of clinical informatics have been key in helping us uh, implement in, in, um, at Baylor. So I want to dive into a little bit. I thought many of you would be interested in one of the approaches we've taken in our education and, and, and uh, increasing our skill set of our informatics nurses at Baylor. Um, we all know that the EMR is very complicated technology. It's consisting of millions of lines of code, and, um, and it's typically authored by multiple program, programmers. Ashenberg and others told us that back in 2004. So this is not really new information, but really recognizing that and understanding that many times the functions are designed by people who don't always understand the complex interaction of the human-computer interface. So if you think back to the picture that I shared with you all earlier, we're really then thinking about, I've got all this technology around this little tiny baby, and how do the nurses and respiratory therapists and physicians and advanced practice nurses um, interact with that technology? That's really what we call the human-computer interface, and make sure that the things they're seeing are what they expect. What happened to us at Baylor is what we really call a wake-up call. We began to understand that our clinicians were very dissatisfied with our EHR. We had high numbers of change requests that were coming in. And so several of our nursing leaders, uh, Harrington, Porch, and others, uh, did a simple heuristic evaluation where they began to see what types of, air, what types of um, issues and opportunities from a human factors perspective, we were seeing in our EHR. So I've given you all the reference if you're in, interested in conducting a simple heuristic evaluation at your organization. It's really very easy. And, and uh, Dr. Harrington has done a great job of documenting that and publishing that for all of our reference. Explain heuristics. So heuristics is a type of evaluation that we do where we actually look for what we call violations that have been built in the EHR. And so with, I, and so an example of a heuristic, I'll just give an easy one, is uh, one around language. And I like to use an example. My husband's from the Northeast, and he's a carpenter. And one day he was asking me to help him, and I went out into the workshop with him, and he was saying, hand me the claw, hand me the claw. And I wasn't quite sure, being from New Mexico myself, what a claw was. And I'm looking across the workbench and finally recognized he was talking about the hammer. Because if you think about the backside of a hammer, it actually looks like a claw to be able to pull nails out of the wood. So he had a different uh, way of calling the same item or the same object. We both had very different language. So in the EHR, we have to build things, we have to name things what are common for our clinicians. What do our clinicians call things? Not what does our vendor call things or what does a pro programmer want to call things. So that's an example of a heuristic violation if we built claw as an example instead of hammer. So next slide. So this just kind of brings us together for us, is how do we design our EHRs? And this is just a little kind of funny to make you smile. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you that are doing this work can really smile because I'm sure you have some of these situations at your organization. Sometimes we design our EHR, it seems like a political process. Sometimes we say, oh, I know, I read one book on usability, so now mm -hmm. I should be able to design the EHR. Um, Others want us just to say, well, I think that this would be best for me, so um, 
you know, do you want a default or not is, is the comic, and uh, we'll say, oh, okay, well, we'll let you personalize that. So we get into all kinds of issues uh, when we let people just say, oh, build this, call it that, et cetera, because what we learn when we look at the evidence and best practice is that there really is a systematic process that we should be using that helps us integrate the best usability practices. Okay. So with that, one of the things that we did at Baylor is that we tried to put some structure in place about how are we going to push the human factor elements that we need down into the way that we come together as a team, the way that we work with our builders, the way we work with our clinicians. And so I won't spend a lot of time going through this. This is really a reference and an example for you all. We looked at the structure of our governance and our education and uh, the tools that we use to build. We looked at our processes around, you know, discussions around patient safety. How do we onboard people? How do we teach our new uh, clinicians coming into this work? And then we're looking at outcomes and some different ways that we do that. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that we did to try to make sure that we had a little bit of a level uh, playing field, uh, to use another analogy, with our build team and our clinicians and our informatics nurses, et cetera, was for us all to go through some human factor education. And we were very fortunate to have Dr. Zha Zha Zhang, who some of you may know. He's at University of Texas, and he's been working in this area of computer or technology interface for years. And he did some of his landmark work even back in, I think it was uh, 1972. I've given you, I think, the reference at the end. But he, um, he came here, and he helped develop the curriculum. And really what we did is, he would come and give kind of a two-hour uh, educational presentation to us, and then we did some hands-on work in trying to solve some problems in a different way that we had in our EHR. We used some examples from the heuristic evaluation that our nurse leaders had identified when they looked at that work uh, back in the work that I referenced from Dr. Harrington. So we took those things, we split up into teams, and learning you know, hearing what we learned and using what we learned from Dr. Zhang and his uh, partner, we were able to come forward with what a better design might be, what a better way might be to present the information to our clinicians in the EHR. Um, this just goes on to uh, show you some of the value uh, that we feel like we have been able to translate into changing some of our processes. Uh, here at Baylor, and uh, we've also been able to help some of our other leaders and executives in our organization understand why this work is so important and needs to be part of our um, approach to how we deploy technology. So this is the slide that uh, Mary and I were referencing uh, earlier in both of our uh, discussions with you today, we tried to just put some things together that we believe will help you uh, as you're trying to figure out how to make improvements in the processes that you have for how technology gets rolled out in your organization. Uh, ANIA is a great uh, networking organization as well as when you go to their website you can find very helpful information. I know their national conference is coming up soon, uh, so that might be something you want to check out. ANIA, yes, in San Antonio. I think it's the first part, first week in May. Uh, ANIA is another great organization uh, that gives us lots of resources, the American Medical Informatics Association. One of the things that they've done that actually I believe that Dr. Zhang was part of is they developed what's called a 10 by 10 course, which is really just basic uh, knowledge to broaden our skills in informatics. Uh, so that might be something that, that some of you might be interested in checking out. Uh, we've also referenced the HIMSS uh, website, specifically gave you one of the usability uh, models that I know we used here at Baylor when we were trying to figure out where are we on the usability curve and what are our future improvements that we need to make. 
the HEMS Nursing Informatics, we gave you the website there. Lots, again, lots of good resources, a community that you can join. Um, another place that our uh, government dollars good at work, I've uh, given you the website here, Health IT Workforce Curriculum Concepts. So these are modules uh, that are free to all of us that we can use within our organizations and within our teams to help broaden our skill set and uh, help us learn what uh, has been learned by the ONC and what some of their recommendations are. And then again, we'll reference the LinkedIn website, particularly in the DFW area. We have really used that as a way for us to stay connected, know about education that's coming up, different networking events, et cetera. Okay. So, Mary, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. All right. So, thank you, Donna. I will also add that the DFW website is what I was talking about is expanding. Uh, TNA, uh, we're talking at, right now as a pilot for it to be a TNA network. doesn't require membership or anything like that. So, there'll be blogs. and So, it's at least Texas-wide, if not further, uh, beyond that here pretty soon. So, the uh, fourth objective had to do with interprofessional approach and how that can optimize of these common challenges. Now, basically, there's two main books that I refer you to that have to do with interprofessional education, meaning that we either teach it in the in the universities and colleges, or and or in the organizations themselves. And there's some examples here. This is by the World Health Organization, and so it's international. The focus being to integrate all disciplines in equal learning together uh, for the better of patient care delivery. Uh, students would learn and, at, at, and work on modules together on case studies and so that they actually get that experience before they graduate. So that's a, a novel approach there. There's some work that TW is doing in that regard as well. Uh, you'll hear more about that through the network. Then the you know experience of just communication technology and the challenges of that. Then on page 32 specifically, how it strengthens patient safety. And again, this is all evidence-based work that uh, supports this process. So this is what you want to involve in a discussion about interprofessional practice and involved with the um, technology developed deployment. Then the other book has to do with something that's more. Uh, North American, and it has to do with this interprofessional education collaborative expert panel. And so there are the organizations you can see many American, primarily, where they all agree that there needed to be interprofessional activity for the better of patient care delivery and enhancing safety and reporting. So there's that other book. The one I like, the reason I like this one is it gives you some pretty significant uh, uh, user-friendly models that you can frame your project around. Okay, so that it says here you've got some domains. Get on board for what the values and ethics are. Get on board for what the roles and responsibilities are. A lot of what Donna's already talked about, but this puts it in a framework that's in the interprofessional um, uh, education ease or language and that's uh, useful for all of us. And then the, the, there's the very detailed on team and teamwork. And then the model here, you really rarely see anything about interprofessional education without the word information technology or utilization of technology. It's almost ubiquitous as part of that whole process. So they become to be hand in hand, uh, involving then the provider, patient as a center, and then quality improvement. So you can almost pick your whole initiative you know, for your organization and cover all the gamut, put it in this framework, and get most of, of what you want to get communicated in this, um, this type of a book that's available. So just wanted to introduce that to you as part of the process and advocate for what Donna said is very much what this model is about. So just uh, tying it to the evidence that's available. So just to summarize, we came up with some kind of bullets just based on what we've been talking about. And that you can, uh, that have to do with nursing solutions and common IT challenges. We'd like to point out that you can create and engage health IT workforce where nurses are clear on their importance, um, their role. So that getting that across is like step number one. We also thought that work on interprofessional teams was important, involving the risk management, patient safety, and quality improvement and IT all together. 
uh, the just culture. I know you've got just culture to deal with in you know regular events, but we need it here too. It's reported that you know uh, there's an estimated five percent or more of errors that really um, are, are known yet not reported for some reason, and we it, we miss the opportunity to learn from that. And the HRQ uh, HIT hazard site is making it so that the vendors as well as the providers as well as the um, academics all learn together uh, from each other's information that's provided into that database. And you have that in the appendix as well. And then educating key staff on the evidence-based practice for usability. Donna went into a great deal of uh, what their process is, even through their governance structure for usability testing and teaching. Employing techniques such as shadow charting uh, for critical processes is what's been most useful, for example, with medication administration. That seems to be very successful in uh, the situation here that we're talking about from Baylor today. And then remaining informed about your health care policies. We're now in a four-year second term of the Obama administration that really, it didn't start all this, but it really uh, uh, catapulted, shall we put, <laughs> the monies available for getting the EHRs implemented. We've got that established for four years. Don't know what's going to happen after that. So I think it's best to keep up to date and, and do as much as we can while we have it, so to speak. And then um, the meaningful use phases is something to keep track of. And then staying connected to our own network. We hope that this is a, a partnership that we're beginning today with all of you through the ways that we can connect and help each other. And that's what I think we've seen out of all the, uh, the nurse informaticists and, and other informaticists that have been involved with this team. So, uh, Donna, anything that you'd like to add at this point from what we've covered? I don't think so. I think I'd be maybe just opening up for questions and seeing um, if there's anything that we might be able to help or, or uh, answer from our from the from the participants, yeah, because we we've, we've gone through this pretty fast so that we could get through our our slides, and so we are available for any questions, Laura, that have come forward. Actually, Mary, at this point we haven't had any questions, um, so if you needed to go ahead and continue on with the remainder of your slides, and then we can at that completion. Um, we can go ahead and, and uh, address any aha moments or questions that the, uh, that the attendees might have. Okay, will do. So in the appendices, what we had actually added was the HIT hazard manager. You have the reference of the uh, federally funded uh, support uh, pr project that created this, and kind of the main screen where you have a way to enter your information. And again, this doesn't take away from any of the PSOs that are out there already. That's a whole different situation. Uh, patient safety organizations are, have been established for some time, and they too have very expert uh, individuals to manage those kind of events as well. Uh, this is more just kind of public available if someone wants to talk about something. The, the whole PSO network and those that are available to some of our colleagues are also critical in this process to gather that type of information. Okay, but generally you see it's a matter of identifying fields, answering the information, and that then when you get it into normalized data, you can start doing some trending as to it and then reporting and getting it back out to the people that the stakeholders that it's important for. And as you can see here, uh, the four main uh, attributes of this is discovery, causation, what's the impact, and what are they mitigating or correcting action as well, so we can learn from that. It's been in beta test, and my understanding last time I heard about it was it was going forward as one of the um, AHRQ databases for collecting this information. And then uh, care delivery organizations are part of the stakeholders, vendors, and like I said, policymakers are also very interested because a lot of the monies that have been appropriated for electric, electronic health records is like, okay, how are we doing with that? And this is another aspect of it. And then the alert fatigue information that we have, and also click to information ratio. I think Donna's team does cover that in terms of when they analyze changes. But it's basically, sometimes it can take you too much clicking to get to critical information when it should be more upfront or higher in the menu uh, screen of the design. 
and that has caused some difficulties and patient um, and, and uh, negative patient outcomes. So there's information about that uh, it, that's available in this particular uh, piece by CBS News, um, where the uh, this is about alarm fatigues and the number of deaths that, that were estimated to occur. But it kind of is a public perception of it. And then the other thing being the consequences, the HIT information is available and the AHRQ wonderful uh, site that I have here on slide 48 is called the uh, unintensedconsequenceguide.org. And it gives you all the evidence base on this particular one had to do with reporting on alert fatigue and some uh, research that on that particular and what the solution tends to be. Okay, so it's got all kinds of examples that can be gleaned for unintended consequences there. The click information ratio is by uh, Tamara Manier, and she's the one who kind of co coined that term, and that being the fact of she um, is the one that identified too many clicks to get to critical information and had a, a very deleterious outcome. And she then created what you call a smart room. Basically, when you walk into the room, to the uh, patient room in her organization now, she was a quality chief officer, the RFID on the nurse identifies the nurse and then on the screen without the nurse actually clicking on anything, puts up the most current problem list and any information that might be available. And again, these are single rooms, but still she got it to where there were no clicks to get to the important mm -hmm. information as an outcome of the experience that she had with that uh, too many clicks to get to the vital information. And this is the other information about the uh, usability that uh, Donna was talking about in terms of the um, lessons learned and the information about integrating it into the system. And then finally, the HIMS usability model, healthcare usability model, it's kind of an assessment, Donna? Yes, it helps an organization assess. If you look at the different domains, uh, focus on users management, et cetera, and then being able to say, are any of these things done in your organization? It might be completely unrecognized. So you would score your organization as you're in a phase one of your maturity uh, of, of how you've integrated usability into your processes. And, and so you can see an organization could be you know, um, in one phase and focus on their users, but in another phase of process and infrastructure. So each domain is assessed uh, separately, and then you can get the picture of what your organization looks like. So this is a sample picture? This is a sample picture, yes. It's and all white until you... Exactly, and then as you do the assessment, you would move up from a phase one to a two, to a three, et cetera. Okay. So the ideal uh, state would be a phase five in all domains. All right, so those are the appendices that we provided for you. So now you know more about those. So, Laura? Mary and Donna, we want to thank you very much for the information and the insights. The question uh, floodgates have opened. Um, so there are a few questions that I'd like to go ahead and share um, from our um, attendees. Um, a question that was asked two or three times is, um, I am an RN and very interested in nursing informatics. What, infor what education is available right now in Texas? Um, you know, what universities offer a master's in nursing informatics? Are there any in Texas? So those kinds of questions. Can you address those? Yeah, those come up. Um, this is uh, Mary T. So they do come up, and most times that I talk, and that's why I made that comment about you know we're very much on the precipice of, of putting some electives together. You know, here at T TWU, uh, what we call post masters. Now there's other opportunities beyond post-masters that we're talking about, too. Uh, the, the, there are online um, informatics course uh, uh, master's degrees. And I see Donna's, many of us are preceptors for some of those students. Uh, they, so they aren't in Texas. I would say that the best thing there is to um, keep in touch with this particular network at this point. This, what, you know, getting these webinars, we have them on, uh, on the uh, Texas Nurses Association website, uh, being up to date on those will actually put you a, a step ahead, I think, in terms of any education that, that you may want to seek. 
afterwards. There are also what we call boot camps that we have the two day, sometimes they over the weekend, where, and this is what I did uh, whenever I, I was assigned to be the nurse informaticist in my organization, and I'm like, wow, you know, I kind of need to, to know what that's about. And uh, then I took the, the two day course, and it really walks you through the content that you will be tested on uh, by the American uh, Association of Nurse Credentialing Centers. So that content prepares you then for going ahead and take and sitting for the exam. You will need the hours to qualify for, and that's why it's good to sign up in your organization for being on the committee, for being a super user, or to at least be on a workflow team or something to that effect. On wouldn't you say that would give them yes. a credit for their hours? Yes, because I think the um, credentialing the ANA requires. 2,000 hours uh, of clinical practice to be able, in informatics, to be able to sit for the exam. But there's lots of, I mean, with all the hospitals implementing EHRs across the country, there's lots of opportunities for nurses to get those uh, experiences in. Now what we could do is, um, I've looked this up before, and for the audience here, I, I, I can pull together, you know, we talked about doing this before, kind of a listing of the informatics uh, programs that are available, and maybe give a little bit more about what we have going on here in Texas for the future. Because, uh, like I say, I think we're, it's, the time is golden, so to speak, for, uh, and I think organizations are, are interested in having their nurses be a little bit more knowledgeable about this than we've seen in the past. So the time is right. So we, I think we can do something like that, Laura. Okay. <laughs> So um, another question is, is the packaged nurse informatics content free? Yes. Uh, this is the information that you have here today, is that what you mean? Uh, Debbie Sykes asked the question, is the packaged nurse informa informatics content free? Oh, oh, yes, yes, for the schools of nursing, the package, absolutely. Um, that's part of the volunteer situation. They talk, uh, it's on the curriculum, I said the package. Mm -hmm. So it's a 60-minute PowerPoint that is delivered by one of the um, HIT uh, task force the com committee members, depending on our ge geography and how we can get there. Uh, and then we, we work with the faculty. There's a, a kind of a stepwise process that we go through. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, we would uh, definitely be able to take an email either to uh, go ahead and send it to myself, and I'll get it to Molly. Uh, uh, McNamara, that will then uh, help with getting you connected for that. But it is, yes, totally free. And the idea there is the more we can get to nurses sooner uh, in terms of their understanding, uh, the better of informatics. Do you think that answered the question, Laura? I think so. Okay. So another question is, what are examples of human factor error that were discovered and an example of how that was remediated? Oh, it's a good one. Um, I, so what, one thing that I will uh, tell whoever asked that question is you need to read the article in Jonah that, was, that I referenced, uh, Dr. Harrington's article, because she goes into uh, a little more depth. Um, but some examples, one example, our largest area that we had was in language, which I gave you a more of a lay perspective of what a language heuristic violation would be when I gave you the example of a claw and a hammer. Um, in healthcare, uh, I mean, at Baylor, when we did the heuristic evaluation, what we found is that was the largest area of violation. Just in our, just to give you a sense, in our um, shift head-to-toe assessment, we found 300 violations. Uh, and the greatest percentage of them were in language. So some of them were that we had asked nurses who really probably didn't know all the concepts of informatics to help with what the words and terms should be. Um, but then when we used those with a large population of, you know, 5,000 nurses uh, at Baylor, as an example, that might be using the EHR, that's where we began to see find nurses saying, what does that word mean? Why, why are we using that word to mean to, uh, you know, to describe something on a patient? So
so those violations of language were a little easier to fix because we got, as an example, our practice council to help with what are the standard words and terms and what do we want to replace these with. I have an actual one that we reported last year in our presentation on unintended consequences. The most common error that's made in health information technology is wrong patient. You'll actually start charting on the wrong patient. You'll order on the wrong patient. It's common, common, common. <laughs> and the, one of the ways that had, that has been rectified in an organization was to actually put the picture of the patient on the screen when the name shows up. And it had a dramatic decrease in the number of errors of wrong patient in ordering and so forth. So it kind of makes you think, well, now, why isn't that a standard, and why doesn't everybody know that, and, and uh, why can't that happen? I think that's kind of what we're trying to get together as a nation in terms of getting more evidence-based to um, go ahead and correct and, and disseminate uh, some of the findings like that. Anything else that comes to mind? Okay. So there's two examples. Yeah. Thank you. Another question from Susan McBride. Do you see hospitals hiring new graduates of NI programs, or are they training within and using super users, or both? Do you have an do you have advice for new graduates looking for a role in NI but are really new to their to the career without um, on the job experience? Yeah, this is Donna. I can talk a little bit about what we're doing at Baylor. So we do have positions uh, for uh, graduate level. Uh, NI nurses that are coming to us. Um, one of the things that um, we've done is we've actually created a position called a nurse intern, an informatics nurse intern position. And those, that position really is, was created specifically for uh, a master's prepared nurse in informatics. Uh, that internship lasts about a year. Um, and that just gives them, we already know they have the knowledge, but it gives them a lot of application, which what I'm finding is that the nurses that are coming from those programs really don't have much application in nursing informatics. They're very interested in it. They've studied the theory, and now they need some application. So we've, uh, we've had one success uh, here at Baylor. We introduced that. Uh, that uh, position about a year and a half ago, we hired one of our grads from one of our well-known programs, and that position now is uh, open again, and uh, we'll be uh, hoping to recruit uh, another uh, nurse informatician into that role. Hope that answered the question. And actually, that answered two questions on the on the same uh, uh, on the same topic. So, another question: It seems like the work comes to a halt when the system goes down. What ideas are being uh, proposed for continuing patient care when the computers are down? You want me to take that, Mary? So, so um, yeah, great question uh, because we all know that technology works. Um, at least our metric here of what our actual uptime, we monitor our uptime, and it is not 100%. Um, so we do have to figure out how to continue to care for our patients in a safe manner when the systems go down. So we've done a couple of things here. Uh, one of the high-risk areas is around medication administration. So we actually back up on an hourly basis all of our uh, EMARs, uh, and so if at any time the system goes down, we have, we have uh, those are available in a separate file on a separate PC within our pharmacies at our facilities, and the pharmacists print those off and they get, um, you know, they get disseminated to all of the patient care units so that nursing can continue to know what are the, you know, what meds are my patients on, and as I administer them, I have a, a way to do my five right check. Um, the other thing that uh, we've done is we've developed toolkits on all of our patient care units. They have a toolkit that has all the downtime forms in it. Um, so, you know, it's, we think of our downtime toolkit like a crash cart. So once it gets opened, you know, we've got to do the check. We've got to make sure it gets refurbished, et cetera. So, um, Thankfully, we don't have to open that too much, but when we do, it's critical that, that, that all the things are there that our nurses need and our clinicians need 
Um, we're entering into, a new, and then the other thing that's really important is our, our IT department developed a downtime viewer. And so what that does is kind of like the, how I described the EMAR. They have a database that is uh, redundant, redundant and is a little bit behind the live database. I think it's behind by about 20 minutes. So when we go down, we can point our viewer to the downtime viewer, and they get to look at the last, snap, the last snapshot of the database so they can still look uh, for information that was there. It's not completely up to date because, of course, different things have happened now with the patient, um, but um, that, that gives us some other opportunities to be able to safely care for patients. Right, yeah. Those, that, that is true. And I remember even when I implemented my system in 1989, I can't believe it was that long ago, but definitely downtime when it forms were, were a big deal. I hope that answered that particular question. Okay. We're about to run out of time, so I have one more question, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, the last question that I'll be sharing from the group, and I thank all of you out there who did indeed share questions. Um, but as a small rural hospital, we often are reactive rather than proactive in developing plans for our IT program. Is there a tool that would help us evaluate our needs and systematically create a strategic IT plan? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there are tools. Uh, that uh, readiness assessment, I think, is what you're talking about there. And that would be, I think, the AHRQ IT website has that. What we could do is I wish that, I don't know if we want everybody to sign that. We do want you to be part of the network for sure. Like, for example, the one who was asking about the curriculum and what's available in this area, once we start having a curriculum available, we will, the first way we're going to point market it and, and uh, deploy that information is going to be through our e-list and through our LinkedIn group. So do please be part of that. Um, there, but yes, there is the IHRQ website. Um, Laura, I don't know how we can get that out to everybody. It, um, it's even, I think, in one of the web the presentations from last year, but it would be a lot to look through. But I would like to get that link out to that person. Uh, that would um, be a great toolkit to start with. There's some other good resources like, I know HIMSS came out with a book probably a couple of years ago where they, it's very focused on informatics and lots of resources, some case studies in there. I believe I remember one of the case studies being about planning activities. Um, so I think that there are some really great resources out there, and I think the LinkedIn um, site gives you contact with people who have done this work before and can really post help you, yeah, yeah, help you get in, get into the best space, right. so you know that you've got some um, reliable methods under your belt before you start on the journey. Yeah, so I would, you know, I would Google um, HRQ uh, toolkit. Uh, readiness, uh, HIT or EHR, you know, that kind of thing. And you'll be surprised what comes up. And like she said, maybe instead of the AHRQ you, and Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, you use the HIMSS, uh -huh. which Donna gave you an example of, and the, the nursing HIMSS site too. So that page of Donna's might actually have some of that for you as well, but it's out there. And even if you put the word in rural, I bet you get one that's specifically rural. There's lots um, we're sharing it openly. And even the ONC, the website. Yeah, the, the one that I gave you guys in the reference from the, o, the ONC, that that was funded publicly. There's actually modules in there, and I think one of them is around planning. All right, thank you. Um, I, there are some other questions, but as I said, we are running short of time. So I'd like to thank Mary and Donna again. And although they won't be able to, to hear you, let's go ahead and give them a round of virtual applause. Um, and thanks very much for, um, for sharing this time with us and sharing their, their knowledge and insights. Um, before you all sign off, please note the information on the, the slide that's currently on the, um, on the screen, um, information that you will need regarding applying for your uh, contact hour if you're interested in going forward with that. Um, within the next hour or so, we will be uh, sending uh, an email to those that attended um, with SurveyMonkey um, link, 
if you are sitting together as a group, then whoever we are sending that to needs to share the link with the other people. But again, make sure that I am getting a sign-in sheet um, from the, the, the group, so if you're listening to it on the phone. Um, as I mentioned before, you will have access to these evaluation links for two weeks, and it will close March 14th of uh, 2013. And then it's, um, within 40 to 72 hours or so, we will merge everything together, and the certificates will be issued um, in two weeks. If you have questions, um, I'm Laura Letterman. My email address is up on the uh, uh, is up on the up on the screen also. So you can email me questions. This would also be the email address that you would need to be that you would send um, any sign-in sheets or a list of people that were attending, so that we can correlate um, attendance with the evaluation. So, and with that said, on behalf of the Texas Nurses Association and the Texas Organization of Nurse Executives, I want to thank each of you for your attendance at today's webinar, and hope that you will join us next month, March 28th, when we will talk about transforming digital data into useful information. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job.